السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين Welcome back everyone to uh, تفسير سورة يونس um, Timeless Mercy and inshallah today we are going to be continuing with the verse that we had left off at we were on verse 69 that we had not completed so inshallah if everyone could please turn to verse number 69. Um, actually, it's 68 that we had not completed. So I'll just read the running translation for 68 because we had done the actual um, full uh, word to word translation yesterday. So, أتقولون على الله ما لا تعلمون. Verse 68. They say Allah has taken a son. Glory be to him. He is self-sufficient. His is all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth. Have you any authority to support that Allah has taken a son? Do you ascribe to Allah something of which you have no knowledge? So um, if you recall, we were speaking yesterday about the mushrikeen and how they were taken to task for um, basing their religious uh, ideas, their worship on uh, concoctions, on one, on false um, thinking, on conjecture. So here uh, we see that now the Christians are uh, being addressed because of their belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or God had begotten a son. So this is now taken to task because again, there is no authority for this presumption that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken a son because obviously he is above, the, above that. And there are three things that, that he mentions that have been put forward in these verses to refute this blasphemous claim about Allah having taken a son. And number one, first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure and without any defect whatsoever. Number two, Allah is self-sufficient in every way. And number three, Allah is the owner of everything in the heavens and the earth. Okay, so these are the three points that the verse brings out. If you look at the verse, it says, Subhana, uh, and we explained how yesterday that is said at times of astonishment and also to uh, free Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any blame or defect. And then, Huwal Ghani, He is the all independent, the self sufficient. And then, of course, the fact that He is, for Him. Uh, or his is everything that is in the heavens and the earth. So Sheikh Saad ta'ala, he mentions uh, in the tafsir of this, that the son, generally a son, the son of a father, is, 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 is similar in type to the father and is not created, does not, he is not a makhluk. The son uh, is not something, someone that the father creates, right? Um, nor is the son a slave to the father. And the fact that he owns everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, in the heavens and the earth and the gates that he could ever have children, right? It's, it doesn't make sense. Something is already yours. You have created it. It is your um, property. Uh, they are your slaves and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their master. Then the concept of him choosing one out of all of the uh, countless men and women that he has created to take one then as a son unto himself uh, makes no logical um, sense, especially when he owns them uh, in the first place. Now, um, the tafsir goes on to explain how these three things that are mentioned in this verse that we just pointed out actually refute this blasphemy that Allah has taken a son. So firstly, it is obvious that a son is either sprung from the loins or is adopted. And either he comes from you, out of you, or is adopted. In the first case, such a conception of Allah amounts to this, that he is mortal like every other being. Therefore, he stands in need of a spouse in order to propagate his offspring like other beings. In the second case, it shall be have to be presumed that Allah stands in need of a son to inherit his um, kingdom, right, in order to make up... Um, you know, to, in, to in some way for the deficiency that is caused by his childlessness. 
or that Allah also cherished paternal love like human beings and therefore adopted a son as one of the millions of his slaves. Just listening to this, you know, it shows um, the complete, uh, you know, absurdity really of the explanation. When you hear, uh, you know, what would be the reasons why Allah would take a son or justify how would anyone ever think that Allah is taking a son unto himself. And when you think about the reasons, all of them are absolutely absurd. Uh, and this is why the ayah says, subhana, right? That Allah is far above these absurdities and these defects. And it continues to say, whatever be the case, it is obvious that the blasphemy shall have to be based on such a creed, which presumes that Allah suffers from many defects, weaknesses, shortcomings, and many wants. The Quran refutes all such blasphemous creeds, saying he is all pure and therefore free from all such defects. He is self-sufficient. The Quran asserts that he does not suffer from any of these weaknesses and wants, which uh, you know drive mortal human beings to have children, right? Um, human beings without children uh, tend to feel, not all of them, but they overall, they tend to feel a deficiency, that something is missing, that their life is not as complete as it could be, that uh, you know, they need someone to manage, let's say, their property after them, or to give them company in their old age, or to, you know, be a source of delight for them. If you think of all the reasons why people have children, they're all related to um, either a need or a desire or a deficiency that they want to complete, or a sadaqa jari that they need to leave through raising them properly. Every possible human, um, you know, drive to have children is associated with a desire or a deficiency, right? And if you can think of something else, you know, please share that um, with us in the class. Um, so it's clear by just thinking about it for a moment that this can never be true in the haq, in the, um, with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lastly, it says clearly that all the beings in the heavens and the earth belong to him. And he has no particular relation with any one of them so as to make such a one his son or only son. Though it is true that Allah loves some of his slaves more than others because of their excellences, it does not in any way mean that he raises such a one from the rank of a slave to that of a partner in his Godhead, right? It is one thing for Allah to love someone. And yes, he certainly does love some people more than others, for sure. But that doesn't mean he's going to then make him his son or call him his son or give him a share of his divinity for the highest rank he bestows on them is that they are Allah's friends awliya as we saw yesterday those who believe and fear Allah and so they shall have no occasion for fear or sorrow there is nothing but good news for them in this world and the hereafter so if anyone ever has to uh, discuss this idea with uh, a uh, you know with a Christian uh, friend or a community member or coworker. Then we should have a clear understanding of why uh, this claim does not make sense in uh, with regards to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who is independent and above every defect that can be imagined. Okay, let's look at verse number sixty nine. Say, inna indeed, alladina those yaftarun who invent Allah upon Allah al kadib the lie, la shall not yuflihun prosper. Verse number 69. Tell them, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, indeed, those who invent lies against Allah will never prosper. Okay. So, in general, people who lie are not liked by fellow human beings. They um, are not deemed as trustworthy. No one wants to take on as a business partner someone who is known to lie. Um, so even in dunya, in uh, many uh, ways, uh, in many fields, lying doesn't, um, you know, is not a uh, quality that will encourage others to become your associates. So those who lie can never prosper. What about those who lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What hope of falah or success can there be for them, right? The verse ends with la yuflihun. They cannot attain success. They can not prosper. They cannot become felicitous. Falah is success, right? So there can be no success for them. Certainly not in the akhirah, even if they get away with it in this world. So the question is, was the lie worth it? What was harder for such an individual in the eternal 
grand scheme of things. You know, when it's all over and uh, people are going to Jannah and Jahannam, we seek Allah's refuge from the fire. What was what would have been harder to have used their mind and recognize their creator? Or now the situation that they're in, it is the day of judgment and they have they have lost all hope for the hereafter. They shall never, can never be successful in their forever. There is a hadith um, in Bukhari, Anas that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah will say to the person of the hellfire who will receive the least punishment, if you had everything on the earth, would you give it as a ransom to free yourself from this fire? And he will say, yes, of course, obviously. He will say, yes. Then Allah will say, while you were in the backbone of Adam, Adam alayhi salam, I asked you much less than this. That is, you not worship. That is not to worship besides me. But you insisted on worshiping others besides me. So all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not want the world from us. He does not ask us to give up the world, but he does ask us to use our senses to recognize his rights upon us. And the first right that he has upon us is that he be worshipped alone without taking any partners unto him. And this is a timely, um, you know, it's it's a timed deal, right? It is over when our ajal, when our time period expires in the life of this world. So it has to be done uh, now, nothing afterwards, um, after we understand the reality, after people understand uh, by uh, the wakefulness that death provides, at that point, understanding shall be of no avail. Okay, let's look at verse number 70. Mata literally is something that is enjoyed. So a source of enjoyment or enjoyment, this is what mata is, okay, enjoyment. Mata'un, enjoyment fi in ad-dunya, the world. Thumma, then, ilayna, ila tu na as, ilayna to us. Maruja'ahum, maruja', return, hum, they. Maruja'ahum, their return. Thumma, then, nudhiquhum, noon, we. ذيقهم make them taste then we will make them taste al-adab the punishment al-shadid the intense punishment be because ma what because of what kanu they used to yakfurun the kufr they used to commit yakfurun from kafara to disbelieve running translation for verse 70 they may enjoy the life of this world but in the end, they must return to us. And then we shall cause them to taste severe punishment for their disbelief. So whatever enjoyment they have, it is only for this world. It, is, it can only last as long as an individual lifetime lasts. So even the best, longest, most indulgent lifestyle will only seem like an hour on the day that we return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It took about a hundred years, but Prince Philip did die, right? Recently, all that royal luxury and riches, you know, what avail are they to a person, even if they had enjoyed them for a century? The best, longest, most indulgent lifestyle turns to dust and ashes. And subhanAllah, um, when my aunt, may Allah subhanahu grant her for those when she was in her last uh, days, in uh, the last stages of her cancer, she lived to be over 70 years old. And she told me <clears throat> when I was visiting her in England in those last few days of her life, um, and she was not able to sleep at night. So she would basically just watch the clock. And it would seem as if so much time had passed, but she would look at the clock and only five minutes had passed. And then she said she started thinking about her entire life and all her travels and her living in one country and then uh, you know going to England and back and forth and changing homes and having children and you know marrying them off and all of she went through she said she went through her entire life of 70 plus years recalling all the significant events that were big enough for her to remember at that point and she said she was done in 20 minutes she said a whole lifetime, subhanAllah. And she was done in 20 minutes. She could not 
remember more than that. You know, and so I was thinking about that, um, subhanAllah, you know, how worthy are our days and our nights and our years? How will we, will we remember them when we are there where she recently was on her deathbed? Our beloved Sheikh, scholar, dear teacher, mentor, Sheikh Yusuf Islahi rahimahullah ta'ala just passed away now in December, last December, after 92 years of living a beautiful life. And he left behind a treasure of Sadaqah Jariya, books and students and institutions who are carrying on his work after him. And he used to, he actually started the practice of holding the seed classes after Tarawih prayers in our local masjid at MCMC. And that was a very difficult time to hold anyone's attention because they prayed 20 rakahs there and um, takes, you know, about two hours or so. And everyone wants to go home. It's about 11 p.m. or more. And um, still, subhanAllah, he had the courage to institute um, teaching the Book of Allah, which he was devoted to throughout his life. And people would actually sit and listen and look forward to that session. And this is the first year that he is no longer with us. And subhanAllah, um, he is being honored in that masjid by one of his students taking on that role of teaching tafsir in his place. The local mosque actually asked one of his dedicated students to take on the role of continuing the tradition that he had started. So subhanAllah, you know, even now when he is in his grave, his work is continuing after him. And that is just one small example of all the good that he carried out. And he was from India. He lived in, um, it was not easy living in the Hindu majority country of India, in the humble locality of Rampur, where he was from, in the intense heat um, in, which he wrote, in which he wrote his books at night. Um, so, you know, the time has passed, both for Prince Philip and for Sheikh Yusuf Islahi, right? The enjoyment or the hardships of a century are over. Ilayna and to us is uh, to, to to us is their return, right? For the believer as well as for the disbeliever. And for the believer, there is nothing but glad tidings that we spoke about yesterday. And as for the disbelievers, they shall taste the punishment of an intense adab that only Allah can render an account of their kufr, an account of their kufr. If you look at uh, Surah Nisa, which gives us some insight into this adab, in verse 56, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِنَا سَوْفَ نُصْلِيهِمْ نَارًا كُلَّمَا نَضِجَتْ جُلُودُهُمْ بَدَّلْنَاهُمْ جُلُودًا غَيْرَهَا لِيَذُوقَ الْعَذَابِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَزِيزٍ حَكِيمًا This is one of the most horrifying verses about the adab of uh, Jahannam, surely those who reject our signs will cast them into the fire. Whenever their skin is burnt completely, we will replace it so they will constantly taste the punishment. Indeed, Allah is almighty, all wise. It is horrible, reoccurring, never ending, unrelenting punishment. A punishment that completely eats away, burns the skin, scorches them off to the point that they're, they're not there anymore. No skin is left anymore. And so the skins are replaced, replaced so that the punishment, the cycle can start all over again. Remember, Allah is Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, the most benevolent. So if this is happening to someone, you must remember and believe that they must have truly deserved it because Allah does not wrong anyone, even an iota, even a Adam's worth of wrongdoing shall not be rendered unto any human being uh, in the Akhirah. There is a report in Bukhari in Muslim on the authority of Al-Nu'man ibn Bashir that the Rasul said, verily the most lightly punished of the people of hellfire on the day of resurrection is a man under whose feet are placed two hot coals by which his brain boils. This is the least of the punishment, you know. Think of a really hot day. Think of fasting on a really hot day. Think of <clears throat> not having AC on a really hot day that you're fasting. 
think of getting hot flashes on a really hot day when you have no AC and um, you're fasting, subhanAllah. No matter how much we compound the most intense experience of heat of this world, it is nothing compared to even the least of the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that and protect us from amal deeds that lead to the fire. And the worst part about it is that, you know, it's ceaseless. It is endless. It is internal. There's a narration in the collection of Tirmidhi. It is a Hassan narration on the author of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri that the Rasul said, he first recited the ayah from Surah 19, uh, verse 39, which means, and warn them of a day of griefs and regrets. And he said, and then this is the Rasul saying, what means, death will be brought as if it is a mixed black and white ram until it is halted upon the barrier between paradise and the fire. It will be said, O oh, people of paradise, they will raise up their necks to look. It will be said, O oh, people of the fire, and they will raise up their necks to look. It will be said, do you recognize this? They will say, yes, this is death. Then it will be laid down and slaughtered. If it were not that Allah had decreed that the inhabitants of paradise would remain, then they would die of joy. And if it were not that Allah had decreed that the inhabitants of the fire would remain, they would have died of grief. Such a profound, profound narration, subhanAllah. The fact that death will be slaughtered, that eternal life will be established in that way with a physical visual demonstration is going to increase the happiness of the people of Jannah. And subhanAllah, that's a really cool thing about Jannah is that it is not just a state of perfection, it is a state of ever increasing happiness and beauty. SubhanAllah, this is of the miracles uh, of paradise, right? That it is ever increasing in beauty. And by the way, Ramadan is one of those times, even though Jannah is so beautiful, Ramadan is one of those times when Jannah is actually decorated. SubhanAllah. So just like to give us some extra motivation to really try hard in our uh, good deeds, inshallah, as much as we can without burnout. Um, and when death is slaughtered, the effect of that on the people of the fire will be so intense that if they were not destined to remain forever, just that realization, that demonstration would have caused them to die of grief except that death cannot come to them. Verse number 71. Watlu and recite alayhim upon them naba'a the news of Nuh alayhi salam id when qala he said li qawmihi to his people ya qawmi O oh my people in if kana was kabura very hard Alaykum, ala upon kum you, alaykum upon you all. Maqami, my staying, watathkiri, and my reminding, bi ayatillah, be with here, with the ayat, the signs of Allah. Fa, so, ala, upon Allah, tawakkaltu, I rely. Fa ajma'u, so gather together, collect together, am rakum, your amr, your plan. وَشُرَكَاءَكُمْ Plural of Sharik, Shuraka. Shuraka Akum, your partners. Thumma then la not yakun bi amrukum your plan alaykum over you gumma unclear or obscure. Thumma then thumma qadu then wield ilayya against me wa and la do not tunzirun give me any respite. From Nawara, verse 71. Narrate to them the story of Nuh when he said to his people, my people, if my living in your midst and my effort to shake you out of heedlessness by reciting to you the revelations of Allah offend you, and it's too hard on you, you can't take it, 
then remember that I have put all my trust in Allah. So draw up your plan and concert yani together with those whom you associate with Allah in his divinity, leaving no part of it obscure, and then put it into effect against me and give me no respite. And there's another translation um, which is very similar. My people, if by living in your midst and my effort to shake you out of heedlessness by reciting to you the revelations of Allah offend you, then remember that I put all my trust in Allah. So actually it is, it is the same. So this is Nuh alayhi salam, right? Now we turn to Nuh alayhi salam, one of the ulul azm, right? One of the five great prophets of God, Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim, uh, Musa alayhi salam, Isa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are called the ulul azm, the uh, men or those of uh, great determination, those of great determination. And Surah Al-Ahqaf actually mentions this title uh, for them in verse 35, Surah Al-Ahqaf, verse 35. فَصْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُ الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ And be patient um, like the Ulul Azm, like the way the Ulul Azm, the, those five determined ones, had patience from among the messengers. So whoever is feeling that they're losing patience, then just let them think of the example of Nuh alayhi salam, right? who preached for 900, who lived among his people, 950 years. You know, his people did not reject him for a year or two or a decade or two, not even for a lifetime, but for centuries, for multiple lifetimes. He called them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they continued to reject him. And now, you know, for some of us, the story of Nuh alayhi salam, all of a sudden in Surah Yunus, you know, comes as a surprise. You know, we were just talking about um, something else and now all of a sudden, Nuh alayhi salam is mentioned. So how come it comes to us like this all of a sudden? Well, the short answer from Ibn Kathir is to tell them, yani, O Prophet sallallahu tell them how Allah destroyed them, yani, the people of Nuh alayhi salam, and caused every last one of them to drown. And let this be a lesson for your people, for Ahl Mecca, for the Mushrikeen who are denying Islam, lest they be destroyed like the people of Nuh alayhi salam, right? And there's further explanation from Tafheem. The story of Nuh alayhi salam has been related here to serve as a warning to the, those who rejected uh, the message of Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Up to this point, arguments have been presented to show them the errors of their creeds, to show them the mistakes in order for them to see them and correct them. And appeals have been made to them logically to come to the right way. But from here onwards, now what's happening is that the consequences of their attitude towards the messenger, now they are being highlighted. And they're being admonished now to learn a lesson from what the fate of Nuh alayhi salam's people who had behaved towards their prophet like the Quraysh who are being addressed here, like they were behaving towards the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Rasul had also, you know, pointed out their errors, their deviations, but instead of considering these things carefully, thinking that this man is a man of sincerity and a trustworthiness and uprightness and complete honesty and nothing but truth has ever come out of this person's mouth, they should have thought about these things and said that if he is saying something, it is not like anyone else saying the same things. But instead of thinking in this correct way, they became his enemies. They started stoning him, abusing him, rejecting him, right? He became intolerable for them to the point that we know they plotted to even kill him. This was because of their prejudices against the right way, which so blinded them that they could not even tolerate the presence of the one who was following the right way among them. And this is a horrible thing that happens in societies that uh, have really deteriorated morally to a great extent. We see this in the Qawm of the people of Alut uh, as well, that you know, they could not stand the presence of someone who they thought you know, considered uh, himself, him and his family, except his wife, uh, considered themselves so pure. They cannot stand the presence of the pure among them. This is the sign of a, uh, an extremely overwhelmingly impure population. They could not tolerate even the presence of the one who was following the right way. At this, Allah commanded his Rasul, 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to recite to them the story of Nuh alayhi wa sallam. So they might get, uh, you know, the answer towards the misbehavior that they were directing towards the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here, in the words of Nuh alayhi sallam himself, hear him talking to his people at the time of his da'wah. That if you can't stand me anymore, if you can't bear me in your presence anymore, if you can't take me reminding you of Allah's signs, then come, come at me, come at me with all your partners. Do you know, carry out whatever plan that you can. And I place my trust in my Lord. This shows the great extreme tawakkul of Nuh alayhi salam. Because if you read about Nuh alayhi salam, you will see that he was not, he did not have many people with him. He had no army. Um, whereas his opponents were mighty and numerous. But look at this tawakkul, this trust and this challenge, which is an evidence for his truthfulness because no one except the one who is fully certain of their truthfulness can have this type of tawakkul reliance on God and be so bold and courageous as to invite uh, an enemy that is much more powerful and capable of rendering harm, right? But he did not care. Nuh alayhi salam said, make whatever plan you want to make against me. I place my trust in Allah. Do your best, all of you and your shuraka, all your associates, all the other partners you have taken. Do your best and don't even give me respite. Don't even give me a chance to prepare or you know um, get, gather my defenses or anything. Don't give me any respite. Ibn Kathir says, do not give me respite even for one hour is what he meant, right? Whatever you can, he says, go ahead and do it. I do not care and I do not fear you because you are not standing on anything. And this is very similar, Ibn Kathir points out, to what who that Islam had said to his people, right? He had also said to them when they rejected him and continued, wanted to continue in their ways, he said, so plot against me, all of you, and give me no respite. I put my trust in Allah, my Lord and your Lord. So this is one of the qualities of the prophets of God their complete trust, their complete courage, and their refusal to ask anything of their enemies, not even respite. And also, not even any ajr, as we see in the next verse, verse number 72. So in, if, you turn away, so then, ma, fama so then I have not, sa'altukum, asked you, min, of ajr, min ajr, of any reward. I haven't asked you for anything. In but ajriya, my ajr, my reward, illa except ala upon Allah. Wa and umirtu, I have been commanded an that akuna I be min from al muslimin, from among the muslimin. Verse number 72. When you turned your back on my admonition, what harm did you cause me? I had asked you for no reward, for my reward lies only with Allah. And I am commanded to be of those who totally submit to him. You know, if you turn away, it's not going to harm me in any way. I never asked you for anything. I, needed, I never needed you for anything, right? The prophets of God never look to uh, people for reward. And this is a sunnah that we should really try to follow uh, as those who call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should never expect any reward um, from the people, uh, but have our eyes firmly set upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be devoted to his reward. And this is a very high standard that, you know, most of us fall short of, right? But it is nonetheless the ideal and the sunnah of uh, the messengers. And the messengers carry out what they are commanded to do before they can expect anyone else, right? Before they expect anyone else to follow them. So uh, I have well, have been commanded to be among the Muslims. I have been commanded to be among those who submit first. I'm living out this call that I'm calling you to. I'm living it out practically uh, first, right? Obviously, they never do something that they don't. They don't call to something that they don't do themselves. So. No one among the masses can make the claim that you are calling us to something unreasonable or undoable or impractical. This is the wisdom of having um, the messenger uh, among them who can be that role model, who can show the beautiful effects of the teaching that they bring 
in their personal lives and the transformation in the lives of those who accept the call of the Prophet, um, all the messengers, alayhi salatu wasalam. And as for our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, yes, he is not living among us, but he is the most recorded man in human history. We know what he ate, how he slept, what clothing he wore, how he used the bathroom, what were the colors of the clothing that he wore, um, when, what color he wore at what time, uh, subhanAllah, you know, how he walked, how, what were the number of uh, white hairs, gray hairs in his beard. Like subhanAllah, he is the most recorded man in human history because he is the role model uh, for the last divine message. He is the one who brought the last book that will last until the day of judgment. So that book needed, or that book is um, brought by the messenger who practically shows uh, how he is the role model for this book, right? right? His khuluq was the Quran. So the fact that we have um, the sunnah recorded in this incredible detail, it's like having his um, model and example before us, right? Just like uh, having the in its pure form, is like having the book um, other people witnessed in the lifetime of the Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other religions don't have them, uh, they cannot witness or they don't have the miracles that their uh, prophets brought, right? They finished with the, in the lives of the prophets themselves, but our prophet has this miracle, the Quran, which we continue to hold in our hands and interact with. And we have this, just like we have a sunnah. So we have both things, uh, subhanAllah. So there is no excuse then to um, claim that this cannot be done, this Islam cannot be lived, that this is impractical and not doable, right? Okay, let's look at verse number 73. Then they belied him, so then we rescued him, and man, whomever, ma'ahu, ma'a, with who him, with him, fi, in, al-fulk, the boat, or the ark rather, right? This is the ark of Nuh, alayhi salam. and we made them. Ja'ala made. Ja'alna, we made. Ja'alnahum, we made them. Khala'ifa, successors. Wa, and aghraqana, from gharaqa, which is to drown. Aghraqana, we drowned. Alladina, those, kadhabu, belied or denied, be with. Ayat, our signs. Ayatina, our signs. Tanvur, so look, kaifa, how, kana, was, aqiba, the end, al mundarin of those who had been warned. Okay, verse 73. But they rejected Noah, calling him a liar. So we saved him and those who were with him in the ark and made them successors to the authority in the land and drowned all those who had rejected our signs as false, consider then the fate of those who had been warned and still did not believe. So unfortunately, as always, or as was to happen after Nuh alayhi salam, the people rejected him. Although he called them for almost a thousand years, night and day, secretly and openly. We only have to look to Surah Nuh uh, verses five to 10 and, and onwards to see the details, some of the details we have about the da'wah of Nuh salam and how it went with his uh, people, how his people responded to his da'wah. <laughs> Surah Nuh, verse 5. He cried, my Lord, I have surely called my people day and night, but my calls only made them run further away. And whenever I invited them to be forgiven by you, they pressed their fingers into their ears, cover themselves with their clothes, persist in denial and act very arrogantly. Then I certainly called them openly. Then I surely preached to them publicly and privately saying, seek your Lord's forgiveness for he is truly most forgiving. SubhanAllah, you know, look at the da'wah. Him, you know, Nuh himself is describing his struggle leaving no stone unturned, incredibly dedicated, devoted, persistent, unfathomable patience. You know, sometimes we think that, oh, they're prophets, so they were like that. Remember, they were also human beings, right? 
but look at the patience that they uh, exhibited. But what was the effect of this on his people? Unfortunately, they ran only farther away from the message. We're incredibly arrogant. Can you imagine a prophet of God is calling to you and you are putting your fingers into your ears, you know, covering yourself with your clothes so that his words would not penetrate you? Like what kind of rude, arrogant, insolent behavior is that? So eventually, what was this going to lead to? Well, you know, when I said, I cried, my Lord, they have certainly persisted in disobeying me and followed instead those elite whose abundant wealth and children only increase them in loss and who have devised a tremendous plot urging their followers, do not abandon your idols, especially Wad, Su'a, Yaguth, Yauq, Nasra. These are the names of the idols that were worshipped by the people of Nuh. And notice the reference to the tremendous plot against Nuh. Think about it, how stubborn and godless do you have to be to reject a prophet among you for 950 years? While the prophet is so tender, he was coax, coaxing them, calling them with the temptation of Allah's forgiveness, come to your Lord's forgiveness. Yet this was their averse reaction to such a devoted, persistent well-wisher, a prophet who for almost 10 centuries um, gave himself up to this cause. Well, if this is going to be the reaction to such a tender, a merciful, consistent prophet, then it's going to lead to horrible things uh, for, for them, right? And it led to at least two things, right? Number one, Nuh alayhi salam, their own prophet, makes dua against them. And number two, Allah's adab, his punishment, annihilates them. And Mullah Islam continues to say in Surah Nuh, the meaning of which is those elite have already led many astray. So this was the way the people went astray. They followed the elite, the mala, which is a group often referenced in the Quran. And this refers to the elite, that powerful, circle of people that are around you know the main ruler or are the ruling class that the masses blindly follow and look up to the problem is if these elite are astray as most of the time they are in the quran the mala the elite are almost always astray they're always astray and leading people astray because of the fact that they have power and influence over them and the people admire them so is saying those elite have already led many astray. So, O oh Lord, only allow, here comes his dua against them. So, O oh Lord, only allow the wrongdoers to stray farther away. So because of their sins, they were drowned, then admitted into the fire, and they found none to help them against Allah. No power availed them. All their power and wealth and influence was left behind. Noah alayhi salam prayed, my Lord, do not leave a single disbeliever on earth. For if you spare any of them, they will certainly mislead your servants and give birth only to wicked sinners, staunch disbelievers. Noah alayhi salam knows his crowd. He knows his people. He knows that the wickedness and stubbornness has increased to such an extent that the only way to purify the earth from them is to completely annihilate them down to the last of them. Otherwise, it will beget nothing but more evil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, of course, true to his promise, true to the believers. He saved his awliya, those who amanu wa kanu those who believe and were fearful conscious of God. He made them the successors in the land. This is what Ibn Kathir mentioned, as the verse mentions. We made them generations replacing one after another. So multiple generations of the good people and from the more good people, uh, from the ones that were on the folk, on the ark with Nuh alayhi salam, were honored by becoming the inheritors of the earth. So you see, this is how um, the theme we see in the Quran about, about how only the righteous will inherit the earth. This is actually what is meant, right? They inherit the land. 
And in the Akhirah, of course, they will inherit Allah's earth in the sense that uh, they will be the people of Jannah, right? They will be the people um, uh, flourishing and prospering at the end. As for the deniers, they were drowned. Their punishment is a haunting end for anyone interested in persistent defiance. And, you know, not only did they fully perish, but anytime they're remembered by those that came after them, they were condemned. Every faith tradition, you know, that has the story of Nuh al it's called the Great Flood, right, in uh, biblical references. It holds these people of Nuh al as sinful, blameworthy wrongdoers. So even after they perish, even after they perished, their dhikra, their mention is not without blame, you know. There is still blame and sin and wickedness uh, associated even with uh, mentioning these people. What is the lesson in here for us? There are many, many lessons. One is Allah does not need anyone to believe. Ungrateful people devoid of iman are dispensable, replaceable, easily replaceable by those who are better than them, who are beloved to God, who love Allah and whom Allah loves. What gives us value in the sight of God is our iman, our iman in him, our relationship with him, our recognizing him, our knowing him. I mean, how do we feel about a person who is incredibly rude and disrespectful to their parents? How do we feel about such a child who lives with uh, his or her parents, is nourished, nurtured by them, asks them for all their his or her needs, is provided by them, is loved by them, but this person is nothing but hate and rude behavior and stubbornness and lack of cooperation and disrespect to offer. How would we feel about such a child, right? You would want to kick them out eventually at some point, right? Um, so, and for Allah, of course, is the greatest example. He does not need ungrateful people uh, who fail to recognize him or heed the call of his uh, messengers, right? People who in their lifetimes act like they don't need God. However, they are in for a very rude awakening at the time of death, right? And that point, they're going to see how Ghani Allah is, how all independent he is, how everyone is at his complete mercy in their lifetime, as well as at the moment of their death. Okay, let's look at verse 74. Then we sent Mim after Ba'dihi after him, literally from after him, but it means after him. Rusulan messengers, Ila to Qawmihim, their Qawm, their people. Faja'uhum, so they came to them, Bil Bayinat, with clear signs. Fama, so not Ganu, so they were not Liuminus, they were not to believe. Bima, with that, yani in that, kadabu, they had denied bihi in it, min from qabl before. Kadalika, as such, natubau, we seal ala upon qulub, the hearts, al mu'tadeen, the transgressors. 74. Then we sent forth after him other messengers, each one to his people. They brought to them clear signs, but they were not such as to believe in what they had rejected earlier as false. Thus do we seal the hearts of those who transgress. SubhanAllah, you know, look at Allah's hayn, look at Allah's forbearance. He knows how the people that he's about to send messengers to are going to react. He knows that they're going to reject, but he still keeps sending them. And not just one or two, but you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands. The number is over 100,000, right, of the messengers that were sent and because they were sent to each and every people. But then after they reject the message, look what happens. When they first reject the message, when they first receive it, at the time that they were fully capable of believing in it, yani at the time that the message first comes to them, it is brand new. There is nothing preventing them from believing. There's no one stopping them from believing. It's in their full capacity to 
believe. They have full access to their senses and then they receive access to the correct message from the messenger. So if at that point when they could have totally believed they just reject for no reason or justification, then there is no excuse for that behavior. There is no justification to warrant that behavior and it becomes punishable behavior. To reject without any good reason at a time when you could have fully accepted because you had full access to it and were in your full senses. This becomes punishable behavior. And what is the punishment that begins in this world? That they then become no longer able to believe in it later. What they initially reject, the punishment for the initial rejection without cause and reason is that they are not able to later accept. Ibn Kathir actually makes this point from commenting on this part of the ayah that they were then not to believe in that which they had rejected earlier. Meaning that nations did not believe what their messengers brought to them because they had already rejected it from the get-go, from the very beginning. And so a seal is set upon their hearts. That is the punishment because of which they're not able to believe. So they reject and they grow in their stubbornness, they grow in their defiance, they become full-blown transgressors. The theme also very accurately describes what happens uh, to these people. The transgressors whose hearts are sealed are those obstinate and obdurate people who are so hardened against persuasion that they firmly and perversely adhere to the opinion they have once formed erroneously. As they themselves refuse to listen to counsel and admonition, Allah's curse falls on them and they're deprived of the ability of ever coming to the right way. This is a huge warning. The lesson here is a warning to be very careful about how we initially react, Allah's commands and verses, to be very clear about the initial opinions we form when we hear Allah's words, when we hear Allah's message, when we learn something new in Islam that is required of us or from the sunnah that we did not know about. Be very, very careful. We must all be very careful to keep an open mind and open heart to the truth and to consider it carefully instead of dismissing it immediately from the outset. Because the danger is of that punishment, of that seal being set upon the hearts because of this behavior which Allah deems as arrogant. This behavior is deemed as arrogant, right? Dismissal. Dismissing, being dismissive is part of arrogant behavior. So then what about dismissing Allah's words? Can there be greater arrogance than that? And that certainly is worthy of punishment and the punishment is that seal. That then, if you don't want it, okay, you don't have to have it. You won't, you won't be able to get it now, right? So realize it is the reaction the initial reaction that emanates from the individual in the first place that results in this seal. Allah does not wrong them. They are the ones who choose to seal their hearts and minds. Okay. So I think we're going to inshallah stop here. I did have one more verse, but only three minutes remaining. So um, we'll stop right here, uh, inshallah, and um, continue uh, tomorrow from verse 75 onwards. Jazakumullah uh, khairan for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa allow us to continue to benefit from uh, our reflections on the Quran and make us Ahlul Quran in this month of Ramadan and beyond. Subhanakum wa bihamdika la ila illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu alaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.